Hi everyone, it's Donna Doherty and I'm going to be doing another art reflection as part of our Lexio Evangelization Bible study. We get one artwork, uh, a piece of artwork every week to reflect on, to do Lexio, meditate on. And uh, we learn a little bit about the artist, the time period, and uh, what this painting is trying to tell us about our faith and uh, about God. So uh, we're learning more and more about the apostles and disciples um, and leading up to Pentecost. So we're exploring Acts. Thanks for joining us and I hope you enjoy this art reflection. Today we're reflecting and doing Lexio um, in our Truth and Beauty series with uh, proclaiming the Kerygma, session three, and our uh, portrait or painting for today is actually a fresco, um, and that is Massalino's St. Peter preaching to the multitude. So we're going to talk a little bit about frescoes, and I thought this was an interesting uh, painting um, technique that I could help explain. Um, but you see right here that in this early Renaissance period, a lot of frescoes were painted. So I'll tell you a little bit about that as we talk about um, our fresco for today. But I wanted to show you a picture of the Cappella Brancacci, uh, that chapel where this um, today's fresco is from, from the Santa Maria del Carmine uh, church in Florence, Italy. And I thought I'd give you a little background on that church. So it is in English, the name is Our Lady of Mount Carmel. A group of friars from Pisa in Italy founded this church in 1268, and the building began with um, the financial assistance of the municipality of Florence's wealthiest families and conti continued well after the consecration date of the church. Uh, it was only completed in 1475, and if you saw the front of the church now, the west front is not even finished. It continues to have like rough stone and a brick facade. Um, I thought I'd share that with you because it's always helpful to understand where art uh, takes place in the context of time. So uh, what happened before it or led up to it and then what has happened since and how that um, impacts the artwork or uh, what it means to us today. So. The story is that I could find was that um, this church may have been a convent first and then they built the chapel and then it was added on. Um, but it was altered in the 16th century, so long after, after our um, painting was done. And it was given a major overhaul to bring it in line with the precepts dictated by the Council of Trent. Uh, so there was a lot done to the church. Um, so. I thought I'd give you a little bit about that. There were some um, factors impacting the church, things like fire and um, flooding in the area. So there are numerous chapels in this um, church and like the fire did destroy most of its furnishings in 1771, um, but it was totally renovated um, in the late Baroque style by architect Giuseppe Ruggieri. Um, with some of the painters of that day. So you could still see that today. So as we talk about this fresco, I thought I'd um, give you a little bit, and you see a close up here so you can get some kind of impression already of this man with um, white hair and beard and raising his hand, uh, maybe like he's speaking. I think his position in his robe is like they would have done in an oratory or debate, um, but you can see that he's speaking to a group of people and we'll talk more about the um, positions of the people and the color and the tone and the setting that this artist has done. But um, on our next slide, I am going to talk about how a fresco was actually painted. And I find that very interesting. I found a few articles online to augment our discussion today about the painting techniques from the Renaissance, so the Italian Renaissance. Uh, they use different kinds of techniques, and like I said, the one we're talking about today is a fresco. And frescoes are done when pigments are mixed with water and applied to wet plaster. The pigments are then absorbed into the wall as it dries, making the painting and the wall become one. 
So um, this is a very durable painting style. Uh, it doesn't wear in the same way that a painting would if it was just applied on top. One of the disadvantages was that the artist had to work with wet plaster and he needed to work quickly before it dried. So um, those colors tended to be very opaque um, and rich in color and the finish had somewhat of a, a matte or flat appearance unlike oil or whatever. So a, a type of fresco on wet plaster is sometimes called a bone, bone fresco. Um, so it, it means like fresh, that it's done fresh. Um, so uh, here we have a couple of pictures that I found from an, uh, an article by a man named Mayernick who um, studied with uh, one of the fresco um, restorers, a master restorer um, in the past. He studied how to do the fresco technique. Uh, and his name was Leonetto Tinter, if I'm saying that right. Um, and he was one of the people who I'll tell you about in a little bit when there was a flood and some of the frescoes were getting damaged or whatever. He was one of the people who helped remove and restore some of those frescoes. So, um, so I have some comments from this artist who also does uh, watercolor and other things as an artist um, who studied this. So he does watercolor oil and he's an architect. He is an author of some books about uh, Renaissance Italy and he has a unique perspective and this is from Traditional Building Magazine. So um, he said and he had some pictures that you could see here of uh, actually creating what would be a fresco technique today, like how you would do it. And I thought you might find that helpful to understand. So in, the, in this technique, it went, um, it underwent like a major revival uh, in about the 13th century. And then it was revived again later by restorers. Um, but you can find frescoes even in like the nationals capital uh, of um, some of the monasteries in Russia um, and that the prototypes, the uh, paradigms they call it of this technique really are uh, from the Renaissance and Italy. Like those are the best ones that you could find. So Americans flocked to Florence after this flood in 1966 um, to try and see if they could restore or prevent damage to the frescoes. Um, by the receding waters and they found out that it wasn't exactly the water that was causing the problem, but it was what was in the walls. So in the ancient walls, um, especially in monasteries, they might have the bones or the relics of the um, friars or um, priests at the time. And uh, that was leaching up through the walls and that did the greatest damage. So there were some caustic elements in there. Uh, they were able, since they were doing all of this wonderful work, they were able to um, take some uh, an exhibit of the frescoes to the Metropolitan Museum in 1968. Many of those uh, detached frescoes were removed and restored by the um, the master restorer Leonetto Tintori that I was talking about. And um, even though they had some cataclysmic events like these floods, they were very durable st still. So like the reason the Sistine Chapel, the ceiling, for instance, could survive centuries of misguided restorations, which is a whole other subject, but um, they have been pretty much restored now. I saw it when I went to um, Italy, the last time I went to Italy, uh, um, that they have, uh, they have been able to survive all of the things that happened precisely because Michelangelo's pigments were so firmly bonded in the plaster. Um, he did give a, like one, this author who wrote the article in the magazine said, um, keep in mind that it's almost heroic character of working in fresh plaster. Nothing can be uh, corrected or erased without tipping off the plaster and starting again. Um, that makes bon fresco masterly and beautiful. And it, it requires this um, solid preparation, long hours, and a bold, confident touch. He said it resists fussiness and rewards bravura. So in short, you could see the steps here. 
Um, there, uh, the steps to do this are to take aged sliced lime putty um, and create this with a, a lime pit at the time or whatever. So um, the steps would be that first you would do a drawing and um, do some kind of painted color study, which was called the bozzetto, a small draft. Then you would do a full size drawing or cartoon. And this always fascinates me that people thought like Michelangelo was upside down looking at the ceiling and he didn't have a lot to work with to um, keep proportion and size and do this the quickest way that you could, you had a template. And that template um, would be sort of like a cartoon. It would be an outline, a drawing, and they called it the giornate. So the day's painting had to be totally designed. You would need to know ahead of time what you were gonna do so that you could paint roughly within eight hours while that plaster was fresh. So the wall had base coats with this lime and aggregate, which would be like sand or volcanic ash or marble powder. Then there would be a scratch coat. And then there was a second coat that was a riccio or a brown coat. And it had a higher proportion of lime. And then um, it would get a brushed outline drawing of the composition known as a sinopia. That would kind of help them create this um, study or a map of where everything was going to go. Uh, so at the top of the composition, that first dronata, that first um, day painting or whatever, or finished coat would go into a, a damp oricio. It would be the over plastering the size of the gornata. So within the first half hour of so, or so of plastering, um, this part of the cartoon is transferred to the wall by either pouncing through holes punched in the paper or tracing over the drawing with a stylus. Um, so you could see that in the drawing that um, you can uh, see here of someone doing it today on a flat piece that he's um, showing the example of how to paint fresco. Um, so they would do that when the painting is done with pigments um, and the water each artist has its own um, techniques or methods. So just like oil painting, there's a mix that is kind of unique to each person. And at the end of the day, the painting would have um, these one, bevel cuts to the edge of the jornada, scraping away the plaster, um, getting it ready for the next day. And it would have to be wet. They would wet the wall so that they could paint tomorrow. An interesting, uh, another interesting fact is that um, related to that, where we get the word graffiti is scraffito, scruff, I don't even know if I'm saying that right, which means that um, scratching in Italian um, that we get from this undercoat with the dark pigment. So you can see how the artist here has blocked out and the final painting, um, the technique in this picture um, that you see here. Uh, it has undergone kind of a mini renaissance in the United States in the last few decades, especially since that um, fresco exhibit happened in the 1960s. Um, so schools are teaching fresco, but in order for it to be really done today, um, we're gonna need to have architects plan for it in their new buildings and part of the process, because it's not really part of our building process today um, and that really it needs to be the architects and um, this artist of course is saying because he's an, a painter and an architect that um, architects should be painters and sculptors they should have a, an understanding of all the arts including architecture so i thought that would be an interesting background to get our discussion going of how the painter um, would actually do this At the end of the 14th century, Pietro Brancacci commissioned the construction of a chapel in the right transept of the Church of Santa Maria del Carmine in Florence, Italy. And once that was constructed, his descendant, um, Felice, or I don't know how you pronounce it, um, Brancacci commissioned Masolino um, and his young associate Masaccio to paint a series of frescoes and scenes from the life of St. Peter, Pietro's patron saint. So in honor of um, his ancestor. So the resulting fresco style is considered one of the masterpieces of Renaissance painting. 
and um, the chapel often was called the Sistine Chapel of the Early Renaissance. So the frescoes in this chapel um, put on display the best painting of their day. They were using linear perspective to give volume and depth to the scenes. And chiaroscuro, the use of light and shadow to bring the scenes to life. The buildings under the mountains we were talking about in some of our paintings as we um, look at a number of these. They're the backdrop of various events um, and they provide some kind of spatial unity or context for the scenes as they progress around those chapel walls. So um, the chapel's frescoes um, included an Adam and Eve's sin, their expulsion from the Garden of Eden, Jesus' response to the question of a payment of tribute tax, um, but the remaining scenes are pretty much from the Acts of the Apostles that we're studying and recount St. Peter's lead role in the early church. Uh, the church's evangelization, what that looked like through preaching, miracles, and even the suffering that they endured. So in each of these scenes, we can identify Peter with his curly white hair and his beard, like I mentioned earlier. He's um, a simple fisherman, so you could see that he doesn't even wear sandals in this scene. Um, Massalino clothes Peter in a blue tunic wrapped in a rich gold robe. So the, the vibrant colors of various robes in the scene and um, other scenes in the Brancacci Chapel highlight the masterful wool and silk production that was pr a prominent part of Florence's economy. So we keep in mind that the artist is usually painting in context of his own too. So in this painting, Massolino's uh, St. Peter preaching to the multitude. Um, he recalls the first post-Pentecost preaching. And Acts tells us how Peter filled with the Holy Spirit, standing with the eleven, lift, lifted up his voice, and he addressed the gathering multitude, which was bewildered at hearing the disciples speaking in a myriad of different tongues so they could hear in their own native tongue. So uh, while we don't see the other 11 apostles in this fresco, we do get the impression of the crowd, men and women and young and old. Um, so he has tried to show us a, a large group of people. Um, Acts recounts various responses. So you see a lot of uh, different faces in the picture. We have, um, uh, attention by this veiled nun in the foreground. Um, the anxiety of the woman whose fearful eyes um, are all we see, like uh, bewilderment, looking at the different faces. So you can see an old man in front who's sound asleep. Um, will the question bearing is, will St. Peter's words um, awaken his mind and his heart? Will they reach him? Um, in contrast, the woman next to him is listening very carefully. There's a young woman resting her hand on, I mean, her head on her hand uh, with her eyes closed. Um, interestingly, like very peaceful and relaxed. Um, and Peter's words are very serious. So the question um, is, you would might wonder is that will she be one of those 3,000 who receives the word that day, hears that call, and is baptized um, and uh, receives those waters of peace that only Christ can give. So Peter's looking at the crowd with intensity. The importance of his testimony is in his face. He directs his gaze at the lame man in Acts 3 and uh, he brings healing in Jesus name. So he's looking at this multitude and can we imagine that he is saying to them, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, that scripture from Acts 2 verse 38. So while this event takes place in the first century, Massolino included uh, some of his contemporaries of the day. So dressed in the capes and caps that you might have seen in 15th century Florence. He includes friars with their tonsured haircuts, that circle haircut, um, religious sisters in their habits, which would have been a sight that you would see at Santa Maria del Carmine. Um, so 
we have again this idea that um, he's bringing us into the painting. So at the time, people would have seen themselves. Um, it's very important um, for most people psychologically to feel like they see themselves in this group. This is me too. So we're invited again to see ourselves in the picture like we've been talking about in different ways. So putting contemporaries in St. Peter's audience um, asks us to step into the scene to put ourselves in that position of listening to what Peter is saying. And um, this idea that his audience might have heard this Jesus whom you crucified, that it would um, pierce their heart, the thought that they were the ones who crucified him and did they know? So the questions become to us, are we asleep? Are we listening? Are we cut to the heart by our sin, our own mistakes, our own um, distractions or detours that we take from the path we are supposed to be on? Um, and we're invited to respond. So uh, here we're ending our art reflection again with more questions. What do you think you could learn from being in this room or the, in this setting where St. Peter is preaching? How would you respond? How would you feel? Are you listening? Um, and what does that lead you to do as we follow the apostles and the disciples um, in our study of Acts of the Apostles and the early church? So stay tuned, find out what happens next, and I'll see you in the next Art Reflection for the Truth and Beauty series for Lexio Evangelization, which you can find on formed.org.